Where's Argon Ball? Is he late for the queue? Recording, is, is he in the booth? No. What? Wait, wait where is he? The, the dramatic music is playing. What the hell is he doing? Call stage three, call makeup. Is he in makeup? Hold on, hold on. Call them, is he in makeup? Hello, stage three, is Argon Ball there? We're live over here and he isn't anywhere. He never showed. What, N no. No, Barbara. No, hold on, Barbara. Stage three is your responsibility. Listen. Listen, don't... Don't give me that. Okay, come on. Come on, where is he? Where, where, where's Argonbolt? She's having a breakdown over there. He never clocked out last week. No, now they're trying his house, I guess? Where the hell is he? We gotta go... We're live. We're live right now, though. It's all rolling. Where in the hell is Argonbolt? <laughs> Idiots. Hey boss, we got a live one here. We got a case and they're coming up now. I knew it was trouble the minute I laid eyes on the client. Looking like the last train from Checkered Pastville. I mean, she had it all. A complicated backstory, great animation, intricate plot with memorable characters, and one hell of a soundtrack. I knew this was trouble with a capital Z. But this was just a distraction. The real case landed on me like a grand piano to the neck of an osteogenesis imperfecta patient. It wasn't her. It was the main man. I mean, this guy was really a piece of work. A real competitor for biggest slice of wooey pie. He had a routine, see? Mid-40s. Successful. He would move in, set up shop, start a thing, get it all going, you know? Carve out a new chop with a... New mechanical design, production, writers, and so on. And then just when it all looks settled and good, blammo! Out the door he goes, onto the next one, just like that. And he'd been doing this for seven years, straight. It was incredible. He was like a machine. The last few had been on the clock like gears and cogs. Marriages meant nothing. He made tumbleweeds look glacial at his pace. In and out, six months, then zoom. Not interested in solving the problems. Like as soon as he was bored, he was out the door faster than you could say brand new slip and slide covered in hot butter. Then on to the next one within a few weeks. Every spring, just like that. Just reading about this guy's pace was a real heap, you know. Talk about intimidating. And he was getting paid the big bucks to do this. While well, I was here barely scraping ends together. The only reason this one had known was she was now the middle child of this whirlwind of a man. Her older famous sister had been his first, and now he was on to the newest and youngest just like that. A big girl for her youthfulness, that's for sure. What the hell happened here? Why had this fine thing been hung out to dry like a wedding cake in the rain? What was so appealing about this new piece that prompted this? I knew I had to take this one. Did Gundam sequel? need a sequel. I needed to know. I knew I had to get to the bottom of this case. I had to learn the reasons behind this madman on this case. Had to find the motive, the means, the opportunity, the true criminal of this case. Well, I did. On this Double Zeta Gundam. Also, if you're tired about this cliché detective thing, don't worry. I'll mostly use it when it's funny or for some different nonsense true to the spirit of this mess of a show. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on. You know that didn't happen here, right? Wait, you don't remember? Okay, just a refresher. Zeta Gundam ended in February 1986. Specifically, February 22nd, 86. With Double Zeta Gundam starting literally next month, just a little over a week and a bit later on March 1st, 1986. So, there was no interwar years here. Insofar as the production of Double Zeta went, it was basically, functionally, just the second half of the same show. Here, uh, let's, let's try, ooh, oh, that's a good one. Ah, uh, there we go. Yep, that fits a lot better. Unsurprisingly, 
This means the staff as well is going to be pretty familiar if you watched the last video. Because just as the production was the same, so were pretty much all the people making it. Kenji Uchida would still do the producing role. Shigeki Segusa would still do the music. Most of the screenplays were done by Zeta's Akinori Endo and Yumiko Suzuki. Yorihisa Uchida, the other Uchida, would come back as mechanical animation director for the mecha sequences. Hiroyuki Kirizume would return to do character design. When it came to the mechanical design, you will still also see a lot of familiar faces. Mamoru Nagano would once again start with the project initially before leaving into development. Kazumi Fujita, designer of the Zeta Gundam, would also contribute a bit, but leave somewhat early on as well. The big names here would be Makoto Kobayashi, who would end up really doing and submitting the winning double Zeta design, as well as Mika Akitaka, who would be featured more prominently for cleanup and design, and then rather interestingly, the now famous Yutaka Izabuchi, would have this be his first big Gundam project. Many of the other designers were not really carried over into Double Zeta. We will get more into that in the section on mechanical design, as well as the nature of the curse of Nagano. There were some other interesting new people worth mentioning as well that pop up, but the drawing directors. Sachiko Kimamura would be the first woman to work on the Gundam series in this specific role. Interestingly to later Gundam works, Kitazumi mentions someone in particular in the same job. In terms of drawing, I thought the episodes handled by Mr. Naoyuki Onda, another person who used to work at the Bibao Animation Studio, captured the atmosphere of my designs very well. As well as Mr. Onda himself, the key animators for his episodes included all my former co-workers. This is interesting for two reasons. First, Onda is another link towards Kogawa's style influencing the aesthetic of UC Gundam in the 80s. But also interestingly, then Yasuhiko would not really be contributing much to Double Zeta at all. So you might say Double Zeta, at least purely in character design, and in animation, is more Kogawa, less Yasuhiku, in the fuel mix. But Onda is also interesting to note because he would later go on to be one of the character designers and main drawing directors working on the very good, recent Hathaway movie. And of course, at the tippy top, directing this whole show, was Yoshiyuki Tomino. So, broadly speaking, when trying to figure out why Double Zeta was such a dramatic departure from Zeta, in terms of its background, the answer is most certainly not, the staff changed. The staff was predominantly, pretty much, exactly the same group of people. But then this kind of leaves uh, us with another obvious question. If it wasn't the staff, then what about the staff did make this change happen? Digging through the interviews Mark Simmons translated and collected coughs up answers pretty quickly. From Big T himself, from the B-Club December 1985 interview with Tomino. Tomino. At present, the scriptwriting work has started about as far as episode 6, but the scriptwriters are really happy. That's because, although it's a successor to the old series, Zeta Gundam, it's becoming a new work of which you could say, isn't this what giant robot anime is all about? I really want to make this one lighter, so it will be more appealing to a general audience than Zeta Gundam. With this style of depiction, we can make a Gundam world that will last 10 more years. So now, among the staff, we're all talking about a light Gundam, an enjoyable Gundam, a Gundam for everyone. In short, that's the way I'd like to do it. Okay, that's it then. Mystery solved, right? Were it so easy. As we will quickly see, not quite. Not at all, really. At best, we have motive. Before we move on, there's another similar interview from January of 1986 from New Type Magazine. I don't know when it will finally be decided, but I'm thinking about a new name. I believe the expression, Double Zeta, would be very symbolic. I really like it as a way to express the idea of a new Zeta, while also thinking of it as a continuation. The name itself is easily said, but it took me a whole month just to think of it. Logical names like Alpha Gundam and Epsi Gundam were also candidates, but given the implications of a continuation, I think Double Zeta is the most appropriate. And the story itself is also like that. Now you'll all remember from Tomino's comments in the last video, Alpha Gundam was an alternative project Tomino roughed out during the mid-80s as an alternative to Zeta, but it was never pursued. To round out that quote from just a little further on in the interview from Tomino, Zeta was a work that I made just as I pleased. With the new series, on the other hand, I want to look at Zeta from a new point of view. In that sense, this continuation worked out very well, and I'm thankful for that. 
With Double Zeta, I created a story plan with a simple structure by way of reaction. I want to make a light Gundam. So, as we can pretty quickly see, Double Zeta was something that ended up as it did because of internal decisions. Not a change itself really with the staff, it came in part from Tomino itself. As well as we'll see later, the reasonings behind it are actually a little more varied, complicated, and a bit of a domino effect of bigger forces than previous works. However, the more sharp-minded of my viewers will recall something important, something I mentioned in the 0079 video which also has to do with this. The Tomino Cycle. As I laid out there, Tomino's productions after Gundam from Ideon onward followed a pretty set cycling of tone and approach. He would do a quote, serious drama, followed by a lighter one. Darker series would involve a lot of uh, people getting wiped out, man, and some wipeout. Whereas the lighter series instead favored comedy, jokey characters, and a general aversion to serious, permanent, gratuitous death. So what happens when you line up the Tomino cycle with Zeta? Well, it's obviously the dark one, right? So the next one ended up lighter in the initial approach, and it's not too surprising, really. So in preparation for this video, I went out of my way to watch through all of Heavy Metal L Game, Tomino's previous fun show in the cycle, which had his focus before he shifted to Zeta. I did find it worthwhile, and there are more than a few parallels that I found, but I won't tediously list them all here. Rather, I will go through them section by section where relevant. Now why did Tomino do this? Well. As an artist, I can only assume, because, this is my personal theory, I think Tomino was trying to avoid burnout on these multiple rapidly paced projects with this kind of gear shifting, by switching from serious to lighthearted. But as we will very soon see, it didn't exactly work out that well, either for the quality of the work or really even for the production staff on it. With that said, I think it's time to stop dancing around the real kicker here. I cannot, in good conscience, say Double Zeta is a good show. I gave it a fair shot. I really did. I watched it months after my Zeta watch through. Literally the thing everyone says to do to adjust to Double Zeta better. I went on maybe my best vacation in years. I was relaxed. Happy. I obviously love Zeta a lot still, but my goal going into this work was at least to try to see Double Zeta fairly. Comparing it to L Game, its happy Tomino predecessor, and to a lesser extent, later fun works like Overman King Gainer. That all being said, it's not good. Now, before you sharpen your Judao face pitchforks and Poodle brand angry torches, is Double Zeta the worst Gundam? No, not by a long shot. Look at that big heifer out there on the range. One day, oh ho ho, one day. There's still some good stuff in Double Zeta for sure. Is it the worst UC show? Maybe. I cannot say it's the only rough one. I like the MS team and 0083 as OVAs both have some great points, but also a lot of poorly handled elements as well. I would say they are, at times, comparatively rocky, but we will get to those further in the future. It's not even the massive philosophical blunder that is Unicorn. What? Argonbolt, you don't like Unish? Once again, one day. Patience, my friend. One day. No, Double Zeta is not the worst ever. However, of the classic core of UC, from 0079, Zeta, Double Zeta, and Shark's Counterattack, plus minus War in the Pocket if you count it, Double Zeta is most definitely the weakest link. In specific to classic UC, it is the least well put together, it's kind of a mess. Now as well, were it a simple problem, god, this video could be 20 minutes? Or maybe even just 40 minutes long. June 1986, Tomino directed an episode with the Giant Egg mobile suit. The Giant Egg had a racist pilot. The racist pilot said mean things. That's the problem with Double Zeta. Tomino had to apologize for the racist Big Egg episode. The animation was bad. The audio was out of sync. Now, wouldn't that be nice? Open and shut. However, we do not live in that simple world. As it is, the reasons why Double Zeta is rocky is that annoying kind of complicated. Or there's still a lot going right, and there's a lot of subtle details being mishandled. I will, in all fairness, try to complement the bits of Double Zeta when it has strong points, even if it's just a minority of the whole. So, with that background out of the way, let's actually get into Double Zeta. It's oddball characters and it's rapid shift in tone from the end of the show which wrapped up merely a week plus beforehand. Picking up how Tomino's cycle of light began with... <laughs> Tomino 
Do you like this music? Well, in Double Zeta, you hear it a lot. Like, a lot, a lot. How much exactly? I stopped counting after 17 or 18 times, averaging at some points almost once an episode. What is funny is, as I've previously mentioned, Segusa returned to do music on Double Zeta. In fact, most of Zeta's soundtrack is identical to Double Zeta. But you hear this track, this friggin' do 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 over a dozen times in the series. Despite Zeta having a great soundtrack with tons of great songs, the majority of Double Zeta's use of that soundtrack that I noticed was largely the three to four hokey jokey tracks. Now, Argonbolt, I could imagine you saying, why do you focus on that? Because, dear viewers, it's a lot like a literal singing canary in a coal mine. In terms of Double Zeta's issues, soundtracks are one of the most direct tools that help reinforce tone in visual media. And what is tone? Ironically, no, it's, no, it's not the musical definition related to intervals of a scale or specific notes. Or sound quality. Really, the tone music helps set is how you should feel in the moment of a work. Tone is whether a film should be sad or happy, a TV show should be dramatic or reserved. The reason I bring up tone here is because Zeta's soundtrack, like Zeta itself, was good. It was jazzy, funky, but generally serious and dramatic, dark at times and heavy with its jazz fusion. Double Zeta following Zeta was stuck able to use most of the exact same soundtrack, but for most of the show, like really the core of it, it uses a handful of new hokey jokey tracks and the few old hokey jokey tracks left over from Zeta. This is really what I mean when I say it's a canary in the coal mine of Double Zeta. Like all of Double Zeta itself, it's essentially a follow-up to Zeta, is a setup as a continuation of Zeta, but in practice uses mostly just the jokiest bits, and discards and cannot really and does not use the rest. Until, much much later, for reasons we will definitely get to, it actually does use the serious Zeta soundtrack, it feels mostly, really, really tonally odd and out of place. Like the wrong soundtrack has been used when you hear Riders in the Skies at a really whatever moment. Then towards the end, once again, like Double Zeta as a whole, the most interesting elements are the slight hints of Char's counterattack just around the corner in the long, painful, melancholic string compositions Segusa would end up using here. Anyway, that's just an interesting parallel I noticed while being forced to hear the friggin' de dupe song one million times in this friggin' show. So, on March 1st, 1986, the very first episode of Double Zeta aired. But it was also a recap episode, so it doesn't really count. The actual first episode aired March 8th, a week later. The Boy from Shangri-La. Right away, through with the main problem I have already kind of said, ends up coming up. We see Judao Ashta, named after a Beatles song, and his ragtag, kids next door ass group of friends, their dirt, poor junk dealers living in one of the, if not the, oldest colony. Somehow their fashion sense is still on point though, despite their desperate economic conditions. We also see many episodic Xeon baddies, who are, generally speaking, fucking idiots with the main recurring one being Marshmallow Cello. Cello is interesting here as essentially being a continuation of a character archetype, one which is now one of my favorite archetypes in terms of actually funny Tomino characters. No, despite your impression, he isn't really Char. No, Mashmire is actually Gavlet Gable from Elgame, the knight-like antagonist who is always trying to be cool and idealist, but is basically a goofy, clumsy idiot many times. This is funny. It's like a cat's personality in a lot of ways. Trying to be sleek and elegant, actually a wacky spazzy klutz. But then, in episode 2, we see the main thrust of the disjointed issue come to Shangri-La. The Argama. Oh, right, that- oh, that's right. This is a- the massive three-way battle, to the death, for the fate of humankind happened. Oh yeah, this is a sequel to Zeta Gundam. Yazan also survived and is picked up. Camille had his fucking brain melted out of his nose by a Jovian new type wizard. Mashmire is working for Haman Karn. Like the last embers of a serious plot landing in an ocean of joke yogurt. A joke gurt, if you will. Double Zeta carries over these lingering plot threads in the clumsiest mismatch of tone I've seen in a long time. It's like, boom! You're watching The Sopranos. You really come to understand Tony Soprano's complex character, the dark, kind of comedic tone, 
Then, the season finale. Cut to black. Tony is dead. Or is he? Well, it doesn't matter. Now we're following Meadow Soprano in Degrassi High School. Uh, but she leaves soon enough, and, and then it's just Degrassi. But it's called Double Sopranos. That's what this feels like. By Meadow, I of course mean Fa Yuri, one of the only Ehu pilot survivors of the Battle of Grip's Colony Laser. She tries to keep up with the new cast for a, a bit before inevitably departing. Even Yazan, one of the ace pilots and general huge assholes in Zeta, just sort of ends up stuck in a literal trash heap of a plot, before unceremoniously vanishing as well. The new cast, on the other hand, as you see them right now in these first seven episodes, is largely where they're going to stay, character-wise, for most of the series. Now, they'll get a bit of some growth, a teensy morsel, but it's a snail's pace at best for the most part. Beecho likes L. L is kind of hoping for Jadao to romantically validate her. Mondo and Beecha are self-interested and will do hijinks. Lino is a nice guy who mostly fades into the background. None of them are really meaty characters, not even Jadao has that much going on initially. He loves his sister. Oh boy, the amount of mileage they squeeze out of that. An ocean of blood from a friggin' stone. Or maybe hut, I tell ya. And the villains. God, even including Mashmire, himself a jokey schmuck who can't go on one episode without a flashback to Haman, they're all mostly more jokey schmucks. A trash man and his boss Borat junk mobile suit. An entire team of incompetent Gaza pilots. A corrupt governor whose house slides down a hill. It's a schmuckus ruckus. It's a buffet of buffoons. Very little happens. The Argama putzes around. The plot putzes around. Goons show up. Some goons die. Sometimes. Fa leaves. Fujita's mechanical design leaves with the last effort being the Zessa. For seven episodes, you can put two and two together. You have a main cast of street rat, just a little bread boys types, and the antagonists who are idiots, led by an idiot. What serious characters you do carry over leave or are reduced to just sort of being there, for the plot to happen at them, like Bright and Astonage? Hmm, seems like a complete sandbagging of any serious tone. Yes, exactly. <laughs> this is my issue, I know, I now understand. When people say, oh, make sure to watch Double Zeta well after Zeta, and don't go in expecting Zeta, space out your viewing, what they're really saying underneath it is, try to forget the standards of tone and atmosphere Zeta set up, because Double Zeta doesn't use any of it. Or more simply, you need to forget Zeta to be able to enjoy Double Zeta. You can see the irony here. As a sequel to say, yeah, just forget the first main show to enjoy the sequel to the show, it seems like an insane conclusion. But, 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 but Argon, if it is a joke show, heavy plot and character developments are not important. Look at the classics. Look at Nichijo. Look at Azumanga Dao. Nothing really meaty development-wise happens or needs to. Hell, look at Bakugaijin filled with Jerry and Kramer and Jambalaya. Funny shows use their characters as pieces in a game of jokes, reacting and getting into funny situations. Character development can still happen, but it isn't essentially important, that's right, because the comedy is. You know what? That's a good point, actually. There's only one problem. Double Zeta isn't really a comedy. Wh what Yeah, comedy Jinai! It has jokes in it, but Double Zeta is a lot like L-Game here. L-Game has jokes, has funny moments, but L-Game is mainly a mecha adventure story. So is Double Zeta. You compare it with the best Tomino comedies like Daitarn 3, Zabungle, or... All of which was way, way more funny, and it's pretty obvious. Double Zeta is walking this awkward tightrope where it has jokes. In fact, two of the funniest jokes, the giant space cross and the pig bone grave joke. But then it doesn't actually really ever go all the way to being a comedy the way those shows I mentioned did. They all have adventure and jokes, but mostly way more jokes that also better adventure. Like L Game, it is sort of stuck in this janky middle ground. After episode 8, no jokes and Double Zeta really landed with me as funny as those two did. And episode 8 is the last that is just them sort of putzing around as an episode. After this point, the plot throttles up from parking brake all the way to first gear. Uh. 
from then on, it also is trying to maybe to continue Zeta's plot, sorta, or whatever. Allow me here to provide the first case of evidence which kind of explains how this came about. Because maybe, in a world where Double Zeta is a masterfully planned comedy, I would be wrong. But now I know I am correct in surmising this. I can show you where this disjointed, awkward tonal mess comes from, at least inside the production. From that New Type January 1986 interview, we've currently written up the first three or four episodes of the story, and I think this will work. There originally wasn't a TV series scheduled for 86, so honestly, we're doing this in a panic. The atmosphere in the studio is as if we'd just entered the home stretch of a 10k race, and then we're suddenly told we had another 10k to go. This wasn't coming from nowhere. Zeta had the benefit of being a project Tomino built up ideas and planning for over something around four years. He planned the staff, the plot, the characters, and it shows in Zeta. Then Tomino, at the behest of our mutual benefactors, agreed to literally double the length of the show. But hold on, because I got one more thing to tell ya. The evidence runs deeper and is way, way more ironic. From Animedia Z Gundam Complete Record. If Zeta hadn't been a continuation into Double Zeta, the plan was that the final episode wouldn't end so tragically, but would be something lighter and close to a happy ending. We have Mr. Takamatsu's testimony that director Tomino was talking about such a thing. According to him, the first draft of the script, Miss Emma wasn't going to die, and it's possible that Miss Sela might have shown up as well. In that case, perhaps, things could have even worked out for Emma and Henkin. However, Camille had to be retired because of Double Zeta, and the cast was drastically cut. Does that mean it was actually Judao who drove Camille mad? Do you see it? Do you see the sublime irony pie here? Because Tomino agreed to double the length of the show, or more specifically agreed to another entire show as sequel, Zeta ended darkly, seriously, and tragically, only to be followed up by an initially extremely comedically oriented show whose existence caused that tragedy in the first place. This goes way beyond Spongebob slipping on ice. This is kind of an impressive creative car crash. Double Zeta's weird, thin, repetitive plot was caused by a rushed agreement to do a sequel-sized sequel right away without better planning. And the tonal mismatch from tragedy to comedy, in fact, was caused by Double Zeta existing as that sequel and forcing Zeta into a dark ending in the first place. Bravo, Mr. T. Now, once again, I bet you think that's it, right? Case closed. Oh, ho, ho, not so fast. We still got 39 episodes to go through. The number one Puru moment. The lost white race of Africa. The plot finally gets moving. But what I want to know is... is where's the caveman? After the Argama departs Shangri-La, the real cracks in Double Zeta start to set in. At the time, I was overjoyed the plot was finally going somewhere. Now, knowing where it ends up, I don't feel the same way at all. Judao in Space Episode 9 introduces two characters, which in a lot of ways couldn't be further apart in quality. The first is Glemmy Toto, a man whose last name came from a toilet brand, a suitable origin for where he ends up and his quality of writing, but we will get to him later. The other is Ro. Ro feels like one of the few silver linings. Her very popular mid-80s Hime haircut aside, Ro takes very little shit from most people is broadly competent and generally stays a pilot the whole series. The existence of her, and a lesser extent L, are what makes Double Zeta feel like a dark parallel universe version of Zeta at times. In what way do you mean, Argonbolt? Well, in terms of the women. Where Zeta had a mostly pretty good female cast held back and down by some weaker characters and some real shit ones, Double Zeta is its mirror. It's a case of mostly badly written, stupid female characters, with Ro and not too bad L being the metaphorical Mount Everest and K2 peaks of quality above an ocean of trash. Now don't get me wrong, later on L and Ro get stuck doing those classic womanly duties of cleaning and laundry, which is bullshit considering how many more men there are on the Argama. But that's really the exception proving the rule. Because in these next few episodes, they introduce a character which could not sum up my point here any better. Chara Soon. 
Now the opening of Double Zeta I find, once again, a funny musical parallel. The opening lyrics about this not being anime are essentially from the perspective of a modern, well, from 1986, anime fan. Someone who takes anime seriously, as seriously as real life, and that the idea of it just being anime is met with the titular anime janai. It's not anime, or rather, it's not just anime. Only, ironically, more than ever before, Double Zeta was more anime than Gundam had been up until that point. And Charasun is the perfect example. But Grandpa Argon, what do you mean? 0079 was a landmark anime work. You said so yourself. And Zeta was anime fans joining the workforce, right? Yes. Yes, that's true. But think about 0079 hard for a second. Yeah, it was a mecha show, but it was also blended with Western science fiction, and with a heap of neo-realist war cinema. Some of the most, uh, real, uh, war stories possible. There was a balance. Zeta, in general, also kept this up. It was a show about transforming jet mecha, yes that's true, but as Mr. T himself said from the January 86 New Type interview, in the first issue of New Type, I discussed New Types in Zeta because I wanted to talk about new types in New Type. But ultimately, Zeta was a story about perceiving reality. The way the Titans were portrayed would have been an interesting theme for a novelist, but it was a subject that was hard to understand in a TV anime. So, you're Tomino. You want a lighter, more broadly appealing Gundam, one not hindered by too much reality. What you get is, as the ancient elders of old taught me, and I teach you now, anime bullshit. What is anime bullshit, dear younglings? Charasun is anime bullshit. Charasun is an idiot, a woman with the cumulative intelligence of a bowl of water. Charasun, a main villain, has one character trait, really. Boobs. She shoves Judao in her boobs. She opens her clothing to show more boobs. Later in the show, she gets practically Guilty Gear Dominatrix outfit for her to highlight her sexuality and boobs. Charasun is this kind of idealized, older, dumb, Onesan hot lady. Even Requa, and pardon me, really, I'm, I'm scratching my head at even having to say this, really, that's how bad Double Zeta got with the women. Even Requa, a mess of a confused cut background and selfish, poorly realized characterization, has more going on than fucking Chara goddamn soon. No, even L-Game fails to help me here. Nemo Han, another 80s hair metal, husky, hot older lady archetype in L-Game, had way, way, way more going on with how she was manipulated and what she did with her agency as a character. Chara Soon is not Nemo Han. Chara Soon feels like a fan service woman from a harem anime. So basically, Chara Soon is fucking garbage. Maybe worse than Rekua. It is amazing to me that she was written in 1986 in the very core of the Universal Century from the same staff as Zeta, including the female staff, in a setting which previously had so many strong female leads like Mirai, Sayla, Frau, Fa, Emma, and Hama- oh. Well, we'll get to her later. Also, the double Zeta shows up, but I'm gonna leave the mobile suit stuff till much, much later. When we get to it, you'll see why, trust me. Speaking of characters, I guess now is about as good a time as any to bring up Lena Ashta getting captured, but really, Judao Ashta. Now Judao is a nice guy. Judao is a kind of goofy guy. Judao is mostly down to earth. If I went to a party and Judao was there, he would be alright to joke around with. If I saw Amaro at a party, he would be sitting by himself in a corner. If I saw Camille at a party, he may light up your smoke, and he may say a joke, but there's some place he'd rather be. And because of all that, Judao is the most boring protagonist of classic UC. Judao's motivations are simple. His approach to life is simple. His sort of down-to-earth, well-adjusted personality is even kind of entertaining at times. But it's never really interesting. This was intentional on Tomino's part. Editor. Looking at the characters, what kind of person is the new protagonist, Judao Ashta? Tomino. As I imagine him, I feel Judao is a person who can get out his gloomy feelings without storing them up in his mind. But that's hard to show on screen. It's up to the ability of the episode directors, so I'm not sure how well it'll ultimately look on film. 
As I said earlier, at this point it's not yet decided whether we'll be making 50 episodes, so I don't know whether we'll be able to depict that. And then, there wouldn't be enough time to show Judao's nature as a new type either. One thing I'd like to say is that I would be foolish to describe Judao as simply a contrast to Amuro or Camille, and that it won't make sense unless you can see how I feel. No, Mr. Tamino, I see exactly how you feel. I am still going to foolishly and successfully compare them because it highlights my points here. Judao's motivations from episode 2 to episode 12 is whether or not he and the other street rats feel like joining the Argama is a good idea. Whether the food and warm beds are worth it. Okay, I, I get it. But after episode 12, Judao's primary motivation is just, I need to get my sister back. Yumiko Suzuki, another writer carried over from Zeta, said as much bluntly in an interview from April 1986 in My Anime Magazine. Judeo and the crew end up boarding the Argama. What will follow? Suzuki. Lina will be caught by the enemy around episode 11 or 12, and Judao will finally become serious because of this. He doesn't have any other great ambitions, and that he's living his life by, as he usually gets caught up by, whatever is directly in front of him. However, he will work hard towards getting Lina back. True to Tommy No's intent, Judao says this bluntly. He doesn't brood on it. I understand that. I also understand that, in it being so simple, it just isn't that compelling as the protagonist's seeming primary motivation for 59% of this series. Judao likes to do the right thing. He isn't very smart, but he decides to do it and tries, and then mostly kind of fails or just slides by. Judao tries to woo any pretty lady he meets. Once again, I understand his motivation, but if I wanted a good show about a simple character who does goofy stuff, loves women, and mostly makes it up as he goes along, the entire loop in the third franchise exists, and you know it's a million times more entertaining than this. Watching him leave, try to get Lena, fail, then end up right back where he started is not something incomprehensibly complex to me. I fully get why he does what he does. It just isn't that interesting when he does it. I get the impression Tomino didn't want this comparison with Amuro or Camille, almost because subconsciously he knew he wrote two previously way more complex and interesting characters, compared to this simplistic attempt at wider appeal. Like really, Amuro being a tech-minded introvert was great. Amuro simply was not someone who was a good fit for war. But that's why Amuro is amazing. He has to struggle. He has an arc. He has to overcome trauma. He has to deal with the consequences of his killing and fighting. You feel bad for him, you want to give him a hug and ruffle his hair and say, It's alright kiddo, you can do this. Camille, being this guy with a huge chip on his shoulder, with his misanthropic rage, yeah, he is, they say, a piece of work. But that's once again what makes him interesting. Seeing Camille grow to accept the ideology of the AU, grow to be more understanding and thoughtful than even Char himself, and grow to believe in new types and the future they promise, is amazing. It's a guy going from like, negative 300 to 100 in terms of character growth and social skills. Judao, by design of his simple motivations, his aversion to violence, his jokey, easygoing attitude, his kind of general incompetence, Judao is one of the most normal UC or even really Gundam protags. But all of that also makes him a simple character who just isn't that interesting. He is likable, but he's not gripping or intriguing. And I got this around episode 12. The rest of the series did very little to shake up Judao's deal. Some other stuff does come up, but we can return to that at the end. Mashmire has vanished from the plot. So, for now, we get to the real filter for people already not hot on Double Zeta. Moon Moon. You know, honestly, there was this one great one-shot comic I got years ago called Habitat by Simon Roy. You know, it's really cool, brutalist architecture, space colony gone feral with this Mesoamerican... Oh. Oh, hold on. Oh, oh, one moment. I need to take this real quick. Hello? You're, uh, you're making the thing, right? Good, good. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing well. So, I, uh, but I gotta tell you about this one Tommy no thing. It's great. No, no, yeah, yeah, really. So there's these two sisters, right? Yeah, they're... Yeah, yeah, they're both very cute. They're very cute. Anyway, they're like twins. Uh, but they're not exactly the same. They're like different personalities, yeah, like, uh, kind of like the Mothra twins, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's this whole kind of moon theme going on, real kind of moon focus. But, but then get this, like, it's the future, but it's all about, like, spirituality and mysticism. It's cool, it's not as sterile as the kind of, you know, science-oriented Golden Age SF approach. It's, it's almost like Dune. And then there's this kind of, like, whack advisor, who's kinda, you can tell he's kind of pulling the strings behind the girl's backs, you know, he's evil. Yeah, yeah, 
yeah, yeah, and get this, they worship a huge statue. Yeah, it's like it's like overgrown. Kind of looks like it could be like metal or or rock. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like Diamogen. It like comes to life. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, yeah, I know, right? But get this, like get this. It's a mobile suit. It's a huge mobile suit, and it comes out of the stone. I know, it's awesome. It's like blending old with new. Really cool. It's like very Miyazaki kind of Nausicaa a little bit, right? Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. You should check it out. You should do a video on it at some point. It's it's really great. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, wait, what? Moon? What? Moon Moon from Double Zeta? What? No, I was talking about Turn A, dude. Turn A rocks. Moon Moon is boring fucking sucks. Huh. Well, rude. Anyways. Yeah, Moon Moon is a sand trap which mostly kills what little momentum the show has built up. Post Episode 9. Doesn't really have any bigger ramifications for the setting, so we'll just kind of move on. After Moon Moon is where it really seems like Tomino and the other writing staff kind of return to picking up at least a few of the threads of what Zeta laid out, albeit in a mostly haphazard way. The Argama is retrofitted with an Omega Beam Blaster, but you know it's it's just the Yamato wave motion gun. But then the AU basically says the Argama has to single-handedly attack Axis and Haman's Neo Zeon with its really pretty limited forces. This is a running theme the next section will go into deeper. But as a solid example of how little the events of this show matter, even once the Argama does get around to firing on Axis and damaging its propulsion section, it will essentially be ignored for Shar's counterattack. Speaking of Axis, we finally see something of Haman's bigger plans to attack the Earth directly by invading. But this leads us into a problem which episodes 18 and 19 have, which I would say is carried over from L game, but made worse here. Mainly, a lot of fruitless encounters. In this particular case, it's the encounters between Judao and Haman. This happens something like six or seven times over the series. With the exception of a later one where Lena is present and the final confrontation, most of these encounters serve very little purpose. Haman and Judao's new type aura clashes, they're drawn to each other, but then nothing really happens. Like, imagine for a second if Amuro met Gir and Zabi inconclusively half a dozen times in 0079, or Camille just ran into Poptimus or Jamatov in person over and over again. In either case, very little real development or plot happened. Now don't get me wrong, there are chance encounters that happen in Gundam. Camille and Char run into big bad men in Kilimanjaro, it can occur. But the frequency of Judao and Haman's run-ins which start here but do so very little plot-wise feels, I don't know, egregious? No, 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 Archibald, it's not like that, it's, it's like Amuro meeting Char, right? Because Haman is like the antagonist, not just the leader of Neo Zeon. Yeah, but in those cases, it was mainly Amuro and Char piloting machines. And when Char does pull up in person, he eventually has a pretty big reuniting with Sela that dumps a lot of background. In fact, in terms of just running into Char in person, the comparison gets even worse for Double Zeta and Jadao. When Amuro meets Char in person for the first time at Site 6, it's interesting because they don't actually know who one another are in person. It's this tense chance encounter which has an air of mysterious drama around it. And then when they meet the next real time, it's in the crumbling Aobao Ku. It's a grand climax of the optimism of new types in Amuro battling Char's cynicism of new types. It was not like Char and Amuro just knew who they were and kept running into each other to do literally nothing and then do it again. Judao finds out it's Haman Karn in the first friggin' encounter. And god, if we apply this to Camille and Jared, it just gets worse. Jared and Camille's first run-in is, cataclysmically, what kicks off the plot. They have one very tense encounter in a shelter in the moon, and then, maybe most famously even injured, Camille throws his ass off of a mountain. God, I love him. These encounters also kinda ruin Haman as well. From the scheming, smart manipulator in Zeta, Haman loses more and more coherence or agency as the plot continues. In Zeta, Haman rejected Camille's attempt at New Type's connection with her fierce aura. Now, with Judao, she seems practically pudding brained and enamored with him. Is Judao a stronger or purer New Type? That's probably Tomino's intent, but in practice, Judao's blank, empty philosophy and lack of New Type development makes it seem mainly like Haman is just into Judao and wasn't into Camille. We'll come back to this. 
What this also brings me to is the last thing I want to say about your DAO in this section before we move on. And no, it's not Puru. We'll get to Puru. It's namely the things which sets him apart from Camille and Amuro, maybe more than anything else, and heralds one of the worst aspects of certain later Gundam shows. Judao is, in essence, the start of the hypocritical pacifist trend. What is that? Well, this also carries over from L Games' Dabba My Road. It's a kind of two-faced approach to violence. As you will soon see, Haman is very much related to this. When it comes to blasting nameless goons, Judao does so pretty casually. He never really has a, oh god, the machines are filled with people, Amuro moment. But when, once again, motivated by trying to get his sister back, now eight episodes after she was captured, Judao confronts Haman, he does... nothing! In the end, even covered in explosives like a friggin' kamikaze pilot, Judao does little to threaten Haman the same woman whose faction is responsible for doing said kidnapping of his sister. He doesn't think to hold Haman hostage or ransom her life for his sisters, he just runs away. That's it. But Argon, what did you expect? Him to be cold-blooded and just whip a grenade at Haman's head? No. Once again, I, I, I get Judao. Judao is a very normal person, and killing another person in a machine is a lot easier than being able to do so to a person human to human. It's reasonable but it's also very hypocritical. Or put another way, if this was, say, Judao fighting in World War II, able to shoot down enemy Nazi pilots, but when confronted with a hot girl Hitler herself, he does nothing. You can just imagine Judao saying, I can't just kill someone. Judao's propensity to commit violence is entirely reactionary. Someone threatens him with a machine and he kills them. He sees a pretty lady, he doesn't even attempt it. Forgetting Haman is a named character in the main villain and a hot lady love interest, obviously you yeah, probably couldn't just kill her in episode 20, but this is really what I meant by hypocritical pacifist. Someone who espouses anti-violent sentiment when it's convenient, or uncomfortable, have your cake and eat it too kind of philosophy. Amuro had to come to terms. Camille would just straight up blast people when he needed to. But, but Argon, later on he does threaten Haman when he has Lena. Yeah, yeah exactly, when his one primary motivation, protect my sister, is violated. Yeah, where he still tries, guess what, to end things non-violently, with Haman even taunting him for it, reacting entirely on instinct with little ability to think beyond that. And what happens because of his inability? Wow, Lena gets shot. If you're a hot boob lady or a romantic interest, Judao is seemingly totally neutered of the casual killing ability he possesses when fighting unnamed or just ugly male characters. In some weird way, it almost feels kind of sexist in how much gender and look seem to dictate it. And it only gets worse later on. And I know, I know, Camille had lots of magic hot ladies he didn't really try hard to kill when he should've. His new type plus horny teenageness playing into that. But if you remember from last video, I, I didn't really like much of that either, and this is just that with even less complexity. As Rao says in episode 23, Judao is just sincere. Uh-huh, or, you know, simple-minded. It's frustrating, it's a very reasonable thing for a normal person, but at the same time, it feels horribly out of place here. Just like Ace Combat 5's protagonist espousing pacifism while murdering thousands of soldiers on the battlefield, the nature of Double Zeta as a Gundam series seems almost by design at odds with this approach. Maybe that's what made it so appealing to attempt as a creative challenge to Tomino. To make a kind of pacifist Gundam protag who is entertaining and sympathetic. To his credit, he would one day nail it! With, yep, once again, turn A. Uh, but we ain't there yet, sadly. Instead, what Tomino actually perfectly managed to do was to highlight just how much it didn't work here. You take a normal, heterosexual, well-adjusted, pretty instinct-driven young boy, you make them get in the robot, and what you get is a hypocritical pacifist whose ability to do violence depends entirely on how hot and if the enemy is a woman. You get a mental contradiction. You get someone who seemingly never thinks about their capacity for violence or action beyond the most simplistic, reactive, instinct-driven ideas. Unable to proactively decide or prevent future suffering, Judao loses his sister in episode 12 and isn't able to actually mostly able to rescue her, albeit with a gunshot wound, until episode 27, despite literally going into Axis to do it 
failing and then trying all over again. The show just running in one big circle. It is his one enduring motivation, and it, yet at the same time it culminates with her seeming death in episode 28. He is sad, uh, but then kind of gets over it while learning seemingly nothing. Judao is kind of just a failure. <laughs> I could joke with him at a party, but I wouldn't for a second afterwards think he was an interesting person or someone I should care about. Now Amuro, Amuro I want to give a hug, and Camille, I want to add him on Discord and I want to play TF2. I feel like Camille would rock at Spy. Jadawa has the same problem that a lot of the plot has and a lot of the characters have, where things just happen to them and they just sort of survive. It's very passive, it doesn't feel very engaging or active. And if it's any consolation, it could be worse. It could be QAnon Jollibee from L Game. Fuck, at least Lena is kind of a character. If you if you thought watching Judao try to save her and fail for 15 episodes was rough, oh boy, it could be worse. Anyway, with episode 23's end, Haman's Earth Drop succeeds. The show was about to pivot into what people told me for years was the good part. Well, I saw about that. <laughs> In the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, Karl Marx reiterated an idea which Frederick Engels also wrote about at the same time, Marx himself using the idea as laid out by Hegel. The quote reads, Hegel remarks somewhere that all great world historic facts and personages appear, so to speak, twice. He forgot to add, the first time is tragedy, the second time is farce. Consider Louis Blanc for Robespierre, the Montagne of 1848 to 1851 for the Montagne of 1793 to 1795, for the nephew for the uncle. The nephew and the uncle Marx was alluding to was in fact Napoleon I, the self-crowned emperor of France, and his then recently enforced heir, Napoleon III, who had seized power. Marx was critical of Napoleon III when thinking about how to succinctly sum up Double Zeta's political and military events, this one quote seemed all too perfect. As I laid out in the first video, part of the enduring, lasting appeal of Mobile Suit Gundam, and really, 0079, was its war. Its political backdrop spun from the threads of many real-life historical trends. The rotting bureaucratic Earth Federation as an amazing parallel to our real-life neoliberal Western democracies. And the fascist reactionary future authoritarianism of Zeon, representing the all-too-real threat of backsliding so many countries right this instant must deal with. Then. In the last video I showed how Zeta flipped this dynamic on its head. Zeta, even more than 0079, echoed the kind of end of history problems we face. Our own rich, powerful, military dominant nations essentially being, and still being, the single largest threat to themselves. Especially now, in the shadow of the end of the War on Terror, or whatever the hell that was. With Neo Zeon acting as the reactionary authoritarian wolves nipping at the edges of our society. Transitioning to Double Zeta then after Zeta really truly does feel like the farce after the tragedy. Haman makes only one line in Double Zeta about the Ayug is exhausted and the Titans are destroyed. With that and the mysterious network of spies we never see in action, Haman descends on Dakar, capital of the Earth Federation, and does in a week what Zeon at its highest military power could not do in the entire one year war. With a grand total of three ships, she conquers the Earth. The Federation surrenders to Haman. To say this felt absurd to me is an understatement. This felt like a bad joke. Farce certainly feels appropriate. Watching it with friends, all we could do was balk at the event. One not even really portrayed on screen. Where is the rest of the Federation's forces? What were these spies Haman made use of? Even if the AU space military forces were spent in the Battle of Grips, where is Karaba? Where is Amaro? If the sum total of Haman's military power was three ships and maybe less than 50 mobile suits, did Karaba really have no force of equal strength available? We see the Karaba Garuda later on in the show, so they clearly have units, when the plot deems it appropriate for them to show up and fight Neo Zeon's Dakar forces. But the reasoning as to why, beyond the plot said so, escapes me. With the Titans gone, Neo Zeon is the greatest existential threat to the Earth Sphere and the Ayug. Really, like a lot of Double Zeta, it wasn't outright impossible to write this. The show makes a point of showing the Federation elites rolling over to accept Haman as ruler. 
What makes this a farce to me is more so just how much it shrinks and stupefies the world of the Universal Century as nothing more than an afterthought. From a place where, in 0079 and Zeta, a war was fought over the entirety of the Earth Sphere, and it felt massive. It felt like Tomino was really trying to respect the scale and powers of a world government. It felt like Tomino was really trying to respect the scale and consequences of that entire world being at war. Now, all this is just background noise. Will a bunch of teenagers go swimming or get lost in the desert for like five episodes? What was once the grand scale and impactful plot of a drama set amongst a brutal war now feels like the cheaply painted cardboard props behind the Degrassi Kids high school play. Now it feels a whole hell of a lot, like L Game or Dunbine, where the factions mostly feel like a mess of uncoordinated, idiotic actors working at the whims of that plot. But L Game and Dunbine had the freedom of not being called Double Zeta Gundam so I was able to ignore the rough edges a lot more. In the August 1986 New Type interview, Tomino seems almost baffled at the reception to his A Lighter Gundam approach, and its lack of respect for the severity of war. Tomino. It's already been on the air for more than one quarter, which should have been enough time for both the staff and the viewers to grasp the atmosphere and pacing of the work. But in fact, I'm a little confused. As far as I can see from the letters I'm receiving, the people in the audience are showing a rejection of the work called Mobile Suit Gundam Double Zeta. In short, it seems the people who are expressing their feelings via letters and so forth would prefer something darker and difficult like the previous Zeta Gundam. One thing that works as an exceptionally good example, and which does add to this respect to the weight of the idea of war, is to set a good sense of space. Front lines, territory, areas of control. In many ways, war is just the violence for the sake of controlling space. In Gundam's case, it was both space and, uh, uh space! In 0079, the white base landing in enemy territory off-target is a pretty big deal. A lot of the middle of the show is just them fighting to get out of it, fighting to get resupplied, getting to Jaburo's safety, and then resisting the Xeon attack on Jaburo. Even in Zeta, a much messier war, more akin to a civil war or coup, Certain areas, certain strong points, were respected. The AU had to fight and defend its lunar cities time and time again. The Titans holding and fortifying grips is a big deal, as is their surrender and demolition of the once mighty Jaburo, the pursuit of the AU, Garuda across the Pacific, and so on. But in Double Zeta, space isn't really respected. It all works at the whims of the plot. Judao can sneak into Axis, the little heartland of Neo Zeon's forces at a whim, then just go back again, have an adventure there, and leave. Haman can simply land and take Dakar. Space is an arbitrary thing. It's secondary. After all, if Frodo could just no-clip to Mount Doom, it wouldn't really have a lot of the same impact getting there, right? Now, in Heavy Metal L Game, there's an episode where Daba Myrode attacks the literal floating capital of the government enemy with a minuscule force. He's able to penetrate the defenses, and in that one episode, you see more of the enemy forces and their mechs and spaceships on screen than ever before. And then he just escapes. No one dies in the main cast, they get roughed up, need a new ship, but that's it. In that one moment, I found L Game to be very entertaining at how brazen it all was. But, at the same time, I never respected the war of L Game after that. And it never gave me an impression of respect. Never earned some kind of feeling of tension, really, ever again. Space did not matter. Even war did not matter. Just the whims of the plot. But, L Game is not Gundam. As one last point of comparison, a very good example of this respect of space is at Eka 7's 34th and 35th episodes. The Gecko State protagonists launch a raid to rescue someone from the capital city. It's built up as a big deal. The consequences of their battle. It feels climactic, and the casualties of fighting in a city are considered. Man, instead of Double Zeta, I really wish I was watching Hereka 7 instead. Really, in retrospect, I find it almost comical people tried to sell this as the good part of Double Zeta. The Africa arc mostly encapsulates a truly bizarre series of episodic encounters. The Gundam team wandering around the desert both just to get to, and then after, the Battle of Dakar. The people they meet are a random assortment. Some are Xeon remnants left over from the One Year War, waiting in the desert. Others are just rebels who use Xeon equipment and mobile suits. There really isn't any sense of coherence or through-line here. It all feels disassociative. 
It doesn't feel like a war, or even a civil war, it just feels like some teens in Gundams fighting random people in Xeon mobile suits. In spirit, I can see why people think this callback to 0079's episodic Xeon Earth arc. But, in execution, it's just so scattershot. In episode 25, the Gundam team basically wipes out an entire squadron of Xeon remnants with the gloriously unsubtle name of the Rommel Corps. But then, the very next episode, in one mobile suit, one woman in one Gelgoog manages to fight the entire Gundam team to a standstill. I know, I know, she's pretty, she's sympathetic, so killing her would violate Judao's hypocritical pacifism. But what kills me is how the show presents both these stories side by side almost thoughtlessly. In both episodes, the show highlights that these antagonists have families, or a village they live in, that their battles endanger the people of the village. But when it comes to the I don't know, entire squadron who has women and children, wives, so on. Killing them and their soldiers is seen as a tragic but inevitable because the Rommel Corps wanted to fight out of pride. Yet despite the fact leaving something like 20 to 30 widows is worse, when it comes to the female pilot of the next episode, whose Xeon soldier lover died years ago, she ends up spared and lives, despite not having any family. Now, was Tomino and the writers trying to make a 300 IQ trolley problem? I don't really think so. I think one is a hot lady, and one is a bunch of expendable male grunts. This laughable setup only gets even worse with the Blue Squad. This two-part later on features the real-life Tuareg, hence the blue mobile suits. Once again, the highlight is the consequences of war, mainly being bad. Well, no way. It puts up a smokescreen of seeming like Gundam, but in the details, it's just kind of whack. Ironically, despite how much people say G Gundam is racist, I feel like the fucking Zulu Gundam did way more to respect African culture than this two-episode mess does. For you see, in the third African village the Gundam team stumbles upon... What? Uh, excuse me? There is a secret underground super city of white people. Now, I have no fucking idea what the moral here is. Is this... Is this a commentary on apartheid South Africa, or or the fact that they're called Franks? Is this some kind of statement on France Afrique? We see Muslim people, and they do a call to prayer in the second part, and then this inevitable battle happens. It kills local civilians and ends with no real status change or impact for the cast. Who built the underground super city? Why is there a super city? Was Tomino trying to say that, I don't know, Europeans benefit from Africa while being shielded from its conflicts? If so, how does Neo Zeon play into the supplying arms? What is the meaning of using real-life culture and religion if it just ends up being as a disposable backdrop for the show's Degrassi hijinks of, you know, Gundam shooting Zaku-looking things? I feel like I'm grasping at, like, post-colonial straws here, like I'm going crazy, trying to get what my eyeballs fed as visual information to my brain. When in reality, I feel Tomino, much like Andrew Lloyd Webber, when asked what the fuck the musical Cats was about, would just say, it's about cats, Hal. Or in this case, it's about combining Gundams, Argon. It feels like, I don't know, they were trying to make this 0079 stew when their lighter Gundams simply did not work with the fans. But then you eat the stew, and they dice the onions like potatoes, they added the meat of serious war way too late, and it's undercooked, added some African spices without tasting what they really put in, so in the end, I just have to fucking laugh out loud that A.G. Otsuka thought Tomino was progressive in his use of Islamic-sounding names. Watching the Blue Rebels mention Tuareg and, and, I don't know, seeing a street full of desaturated Muslim people praying while the Gundam team just kind of awkwardly stands around in neon 80s workout nonsense clothing, it all feels like a bad young adult novel. But really, the Africa arc stuff is not the worst, because oh boy, oh boy, what caps off the Earth arc is Dublin and Haman's colony drop. Now let me tell you right now, if there was a single big tipping point for what I thought of Double Zeta, okay, it was Puru, okay, haha, but that was more of a slow corkscrewing in my brain. If it was one big thing, it was Dublin. Going in, I remember distinctly feeling that the colony drop must be a big deal. After all, it's an iconic thing, which really sells the impact of 0079 as soon as you see it in the opening narration. Even just the attempt at a colony drop in Zeta is also a huge friggin' deal. Surely, surely, I thought, double Zeta's colony drop must also happen for big reasons, right? I thought that Haman's forces losing to the Gundam team and with probably Federation support are turning the tide 
After all, this is over halfway through the show, that lines up kind of with 0079's post Jabiro arc. Oh, how naive I was. As I approached the Dublin arc, I realized that Haman's forces were pretty much unchallenged. If anything, the nefarious elements are only just getting stronger. No, when the show said that the Federation elites who fled Dakar had headed to Dublin, the site of the major Fetty base, I thought, I had it. Figured. Finally. Haman was trying to crush the Fetty government remnants. Surely. Only, once again, I was wrong. The Federation had already surrendered to Haman. The plotline of the elites being nearby is wrapped up in episode 33. The colony drop in full happens with episode 35. Haman's reasoning is idiotic. It is, quite frankly, retarded. She is doing this because she is now a despot on par with Girin, if not worse. Haman went from just wanting to rule the Earth and Zeta to now embracing Girin's eugenic twisting of Zeon Daikun's philosophy. Uh, why? Because the plot said so. Once again, with forces a fraction the size of Zeon, they carry it out flawlessly. Over episodes 34 and 35, Neo Zeon blows up hospital ships, tries to trap people in Dublin. The Ayug tries to airlift as many people as possible out of the city. Neo Zeon, an organization once portrayed as comically incompetent initially, filled with goofy idiocy, now becomes worse than Zeon itself. At least Operation British was supposed to smash Jabiro. The Titan's colony drop was an attempt to destroy the Ayug. Char's plan and Char's counterattack has a desperation to it in the lopsided nature of CCA's much better written conflict. Even Operation Stardust in 0083 seems downright Machiavellian in its goals and ambitions. Now, the real kicker here is this is just one gigantic, poorly executed course correction. From November 1986, new type, Tomino. In my previous interview, in the August issue of the magazine, I said that I'd like to keep making Double Zeta like Double Zeta, and that I wanted to go all the way to the end with that same atmosphere. But the current Double Zeta, especially from August onwards, has become fairly serious, with an atmosphere close to the previous Zeta. If you ask me why, I didn't do it with any particular aim. Simply put, due to various factors we wouldn't have been able to continue broadcasting Double Zeta as it was. I didn't do it with any particular aim. Boy howdy, that sums it up pretty well. I told you there was more to this case than just the wayward director trying to do a funny. The due to various factors bit we will come to towards the end. That's when the scope of the evidence will line up pretty nicely if I've planned this out well. To wrap up this section, I want to really highlight how much this course correction and the nature of Double Zeta's war totally borks the show. It makes Judao's ineffectual run-ins with Haman seem pathetically incompetent. In his and the Gundam team's wacky Degrassi bullshit hijinks and farting around the desert, yes, the fate of billions of people on Earth is in the hands of, as Tomino said in one interview, putting brain new types. Phenomenal. And once the wacky antagonists, who were idiotic and goofy, have now been retrofitted to become worse than Gir and Zabi tier villains. Haman's casual seizure and dominance of the Earth, followed up with her genocidal Dublin colony drop, hamstrings all the lesser Neo Zeon cast right alongside the plot. Mashmire, a goofy, goopy, gavlet, gablet type character, is now the one responsible for initiating the colony drop from orbit. Thank God he left the plot so that he could come back as a genocidal asshole. And Glemmy. Glemmy goes from someone who seemed to have no motivation beyond wooing Roe to a monster with an army of clone cyber new types in his basement. Glemmy kept Lena around, educated her in aristocratic traditions for some reason, then just didn't do anything with her. He wrote a goofy character who hung on to Judao's sister. Why? Because, you know, probably that was an easy way to keep Judao's motivation the same without having to develop it. Then, when you did need to turn Glemmy into a monster and master manipulator and villain on par with Haman, he makes no use of Lena. Haman highlighting this failure of Glemmy's motivation doesn't excuse it. Where's that, where's that giant Lena projection? Oh, uh, there it is. Okay, let's just put that on there. Ah, problem solved. Really, what should have surprised no one is that the next quote from Akinari Endo, one of the main writer, pretty much seals the friggin' deal. At first, Glemmy was just a guy named Soldier A. That was when he first appeared in Episode 9, Judao in Space. At that point, he was simply a naive young soldier who was tricked by Ruluka. But in the second draft stage, I was given the instruction, it would be better if he had a name. This has happened a lot since the days of Zeta. 
but in the next meeting, director Tomino said, that's a character we could expand more, so let's flesh him out in various ways. We ended up inflating Glemmy's role in the form of Shar Aznable in Double Zeta. So, if you feel like he was initially a lightweight character, but is gradually getting heavier, then please assume we planned that from the start. Glemmy isn't just Haman's subordinate, but is acting based on his own true objectives. As to what his true objectives are, that may be revealed at the end of the story. From the beginning, it was always possible that Shar might not appear in Double Zeta. Now, I already had my suspicions, but why did this character just so suddenly become so evil and important when none of the previous appearances had this ounce of this? Well, because as Endo spells out in that quote, they pulled it out of their friggin' ass. Probably desperately realizing they lacked a counterweight or additional antagonist with real agency besides Haman. They were making it up as they went along. Unlike Paptimus or Girin, who were broadly planned out, the lighter Gundam's war was not meshing with fans. In an attempt at a more popular approach, they fucked up. Then, they course-corrected mid-show, and in the process had to bolt, weld, and staple on motivation, actions, and atrocities, regardless of whether they meshed with the up-until-then on-screen actions. In the end, Double Zeta's war is like Double Zeta's characters, and like Double Zeta in general. It's a mess. First way too light, then overcompensating and trying to be way, way too heavy. It has a bad sense of conflict. Now, with that all being said, this leads to the really big question. The real big question. What exactly were these various factors? What motivated Tomino to double uh, Zeta with another series? And what then helped cause the desperate course correction? Now, I would love to tell you that right now. But we have one final important thing to get out of the way. One final, annoying, petulant, stupid thing. Or rather, someone. Or maybe it's best put as, some L people. Let me start by saying that due to the nature of this section's topic, I cannot go in full depth. But Argon, these videos are already so long! If the point isn't to go in depth, then why not? Because, if I did, this video would be four hours long, with two hours being just this one section alone, only tangentially relating to said character in question. As well, consider this something of an olive branch, because one day, oh, one day, I will go in depth. One day, there will be a reckoning. On that day, I won't hold anything back. Nothing. A terrible reckoning of the tribe I am part of. Oh, how bloody it will be. So, until then, this section will try to be more focused on the issue at hand. That is, namely, Double Zeta's whole little sister thing. Now listen, there's there's no way a normie is going to be able to deal with this section, so if you are not the most uh, anime watching her, or not the old classic, a filthy fucking weeb, feel free to skip this part. With that out of the way, there is no two ways about this. I despise Puru. But that really doesn't capture the heart of it, you know? What I despise is more than Puru. Puru's actions are annoying, but it's what really Puru represents. Let us start with the basic premise. I think we can all agree on which underlines this. Anime is the world of the desired. That is to say, by mechanism of animation, the world of anime is a world where all the things we desire can come together. Take the mobile suit. It's a great example. In many ways, as I have explained in the past, the mobile suit, or even mecha, are not arbitrary things. A set of conditions spawned a desire. The alienating nature of modern war, the terrifying power of modern machines. Humankind and its future battlefields on Earth, and in space, all of these came together. Mecha is a response to that. It's an answer to the question of the human heart. Mecha then had to deal with the implications of that the implications of the destruction and the power of war, of responsibility, the limitations of the real world imposed onto fantasy, grounding it, giving it a kind of life. In this way, I both understand and respect Mecha. But obviously enough, anime features a lot more responses and a lot more answers to this question of the heart. God, you know, when I say it like that, it almost sounds like some poetic mumbo-jumbo. You know, kind of like Mishima wrote it, don't it? Well... The problem of this section, the problem of Puru, is about one of these answers, let's say. An ideal, in this case not a mechanical or industrial one at all, 
an unfortunately romantic, probably sexual, and gendered one. Which, uh, I don't know about you, but nuclear metal titans cutting each other in half with laser blades seem pretty tame in comparison. To stop beating around the bush, I'm gonna use an answer I've already gone over. Chara Soon. Not really her character, but what Chara Soon is. You see, we have a medium of story. Animation. The people who make it have, uh, certain hang-ups. Then the people who watch it pass on those hang-ups. As I went over last time, Zeta was really Gundam's generation of imposed-upon youth joining the workforce. Even myself, you could say, is merely someone cursed with the impression of Mecha. Now to Charasun. Charasun is a fantasy. An attractive older woman with an aggressive, engaged sexuality. Chara is an archetype. An imposed fantasy archetype. Now, any character in anime can be an archetype. Sure, is a famous one, and archetypes alone do not a problem make. Rather, it lies in the certain kinds in use, specifically in Double Zeta. She shove her boob in Judao's face! What's important to remember here is this isn't exactly some literal desire reality per se, any more than Mobile Suit is a, you know, kind of literal fighting machine alongside a tank or fighter plane. Rather, Soon's dominating, dumb, hot old lady is kind of an ideal, a desire filled out by anime. Even if the opening insists anime janai from the perspective of its lyrics, it's extremely, extremely a friggin' anime bullshit thing. Remember that term from earlier? Well now you know the philosophical backing. An absurd archetypal fantasy brought about and reinforced by the medium of Japanese animation. It's kind of a bit long compared to anime bullshit, right? Now. To some, even mobile suits themselves are too much anime bullshit. Anime bullshit is a sliding scale. It's not a black and white dichotomy. Worse yet, there are many kinds of anime bullshit. So it's, I guess it's more like a Photoshop color picker maybe. But all things considered, as Garbo as Char Soon is, she is really the lesser evil. The bigger problem really is Puru and the little sister thing. The archetype Puru represents to a friggin' T this fetishistic ideal of a pure young sister, but really a young romantic partner. Really, underaged is probably the actual best bullet to shoot into the head of this annoying brat and what she represents. Lena is also, and yes, this is the right time to break the glass and bust this term out, problematic a character. When the show goes out of its way to show a canonically 10-year-old girl's underwear, or the multiple, multiple, multiple times it makes room for Puru to do fan service or just generally racy stuff. When I see this, I don't feel like I'm watching a landmark science fiction work in an animated form which championed a new style of mecha storytelling and had its compelling cast struggling in a setting of dire war, using fantastical but appealing machines of war. I feel like an adult watching a toy commercial for idiots from 40 years ago. Yeah, that's how much this drains me. This baseline attempt at flaunting some kind of sexual excitement with this annoying fucking brat. It makes me feel like I don't give a shit about Gundam. It was made to appeal to THOSE fans. You know the ones. Our Gundam, you like us. You nerd, you weep. One of us, one of us. You like cute girl, you like big cool robot. You don't get complain about fan service. You ignore no bad, no bad. They not real, is no wrong. Yes, no room, just picture, no bar. You like, you like. Um, but am I though? Because, uh, honestly, when I see this shit, I despise it. Listen, I clearly love this Gundam stuff. I clearly love a lot of this anime crap. So it's not a black and white issue. It's not love it or hate it. It's just, goddamn, I have certain tolerances and Double Zeta exceeds them. I mean, even fucking Tomino himself in the Daitarn 3 Chronicle complained. Ever since I was on writing, I've been asked to do panty shots. After all, that's all Japanese people enjoy, I said. So it's time to take the panties out. Hmm, and white panties, huh? I was upset. So when I do panty shot, everyone shuts up. You guys have that much of a hobby, don't you? To be honest, I really hated it. Boy, what happened with this show? What mandated this fucking appeal to those fans? I'm not really crazy here, even the name I kind of despise, fan service, like it's just an expected thing. Like, oh, that, that anime, I get it, it's a medium of fulfilling fantasies. But this shit with Puru, oh, Judao, I want to take a bath. Oh, here, Judao, let me lick your face. Moe, moe, kyun, kyun. It feels like the story is treating me like a fucking moron. Oh, oh, sorry, you were 
getting bored with actually trying to get invested in the story and the world and, you know, the other characters, well, don't worry, here's some little girl underpants to get you excited. Fuck off. I won't pretend that anime isn't and hasn't always been a medium of attractive characters for men and women, for the normosexuals and the jays. I also would be lying if in my younger days the Baba Palooza characters didn't absolutely help suck me into this medium. But even then, I had my tolerances for this stuff. As I got older, that didn't change very much. I can at least tolerate a Charasun on the grounds of, hey, at least this character is an adult. But Gundam aside, Puru is pushing it way too far. This ridiculous quote, pure younger sister girl shtick. It's pathetic on this level of, oh, you can't romantically pursue the, you know, attractive same age girl you know. You ignore the other attractive slightly older girl for the entire series. Even the hot older boob lady, you ignore. But yeah, make as much room as time and just, you know, make room as possible for Puru. Puru gets the focus. Uh-huh. No, no, cuz Jida loves his little sister, see, so, uh, it's like that. Uh-huh, it, it's totally not left ambiguous for the audience. Gundam is anime. Gundam had Char and Garma as a perfect example of just close enough that the Fujoshi could ship it the last 10 centimeters. And Puru and Judao, by that freaking standard, are practically going steady. No, no, cause uh, Judao is only 14, right? So Puru isn't that much younger, see? Uh huh, and the audience of the show, who, you know, most of this fan service is directed to, were definitely also only 13 or 14. After all, it's not like Gundam was a big hit with older crowds which helped propel it to long-lasting success. Don't make me fucking laugh. You know... That just ain't right! It's bullshit. It's primo anime bullshit. And oh boy, that's just the fanservice aspect. When you put that shit aside, it just gets worse. But even better, I have a funny, funny little quote here from Animech May 1986, turning from Zeta to Double Zeta. Editor. Will you be considering characters like Lala or Four in the upcoming story? Tomino, I'm not thinking about that at all. Every time we do that, it gets more repetitive, right? So I wasn't planning anything like that. Hmm. Puru is a new type cute girl who fights for the enemy. Hmm. I wonder what is going to happen to her. It was already repetitive when we watched the fourth not Lala of Rosami die in Zeta. The fifth, sixth, and seventh through I don't fucking know how many more Glemmy kept in his basement doesn't change that. Then, to top it off, by the end of the next episode, Judao seems barely phased by her death. He recovers and is back to his ganky old self. Actually hilarious how little Puru mattered. I would have been, I mean, actually more blown away if a single one in Double Zeta lived. I guess that was such an enticing idea, it's no wonder Fukui would use it in Unicorn. Oh, wait. Really, I think the kind of to best explain my reasoning here. I want to tell you a little story. You see, once upon a time, in my younger days, I just started watching a heap of anime. I'd been watching for, oh, say a year. Let's say a year. Not on TV, mind you. I'd seen anime on TV before. This time, on the internet. And you see, I'd been watching all sorts of stuff, and I, you know, happened to, for some reason, watch this one show. It had a, it had a really killer opening. You know, one of those that kind of sticks with you, and it's kind of almost wasted on the show. It's kind of great Gustav Klimt kind of reference in this real melancholic song. Hooked me in right away. So I binge watch like, you know, almost the whole series in like, I want to say two to three days. And oh man, <laughs> it messed me up bad. I mean, this security guys in the first episode are just like splattered left and right. And there's this cute girl with horns who's like half naked, but then she's like, you know, just killing people, just wiping people out, and then the rest of the series happens, and it was just too raw. And then the worst part was, get this, I had to go on summer break. No new anime, no new audiovisual information. My poor, raw little brain stuck in a cabin thinking about the anime. No way to explain to the non-anime watching people around me how much it really messed me up, you know. And there I was, you know, sniveling and groveling. Oh no, Argon, you've you've done it now. You know, perhaps we went too animate this time. Sitting in a pool of my tears, I was about, you know, that was about three or five-ish days in. But then something happened. Something changed inside me. It was slow, it was building slowly. I started to think. You know, not, not just about how the show was. I I mean I really started thinking. Something something really changed. You know, like, 
you know, the rest of the show didn't really match kind of the tone of that first episode. Or, or maybe it was just the rest of the show was just so tasteless, it kind of exposed how kind of gratuitous it was. And then it happened. Wait a minute, the whole arc with, like, the other girl who's just a bomb? She has a bomb in her? Isn't that basically just the fucking bomb pie episode from Spongebob? And at last it happened. You know, it's really just a worse version of Akira. One where the main character sucks. And they say his brain grew three sizes that day. Wait. Wait, this show. This, this show which had me sobbing, had me torn up. The quality of this show, this entire show, is... is stupid! <laughs> moment I vowed. If a show moves me to tears, it must do so on the quality of its animation, but really, writing and characterization. The gods smiled upon me, the heavens opened. From that day forward, I continued to grow smarter and stronger, taller, faster. I manifested into a powerful being. Or maybe it was just puberty. Well, either way, I never forgot. Now, don't get me wrong, I didn't become a jaded cynic. There is definitely been some shows, shows with even cute girls, which really made me, as they say, messy cry. But damn if those shows didn't earn it. They passed my threshold with flying colors. Double Zeta, that is Puru, most certainly did not. I refuse to begin to give a shit about this character designed to be a saccharine archetype and shoved into the forefront of this show's screen time and plot, only to inevitably fucking die. God, imagine if Rao or L had had that screen time instead, wouldn't that be good? So given the prerogative, make a broadly appealing Gundam. I think Puru was just that. Easy fan service for the Lollicon crowd. For those otaku. The mid-80s cream lemon boom type otaku. You know the people who were, you know, reading lemon people around Double Zeta's time. Or as it was known, L people. Or, with a Japanese accent, Erupe Puru. Chich, I got you Argon. Oh? I got you dead to rights, yeah. It wasn't Lemon People, it wasn't for the Lilikan Otaku audience. I have hard evidence. Her name comes from this. Animedia Mobile Suit Gundam ZZ Part 1 and 2. The adorable fairy Arapo Pri Arapo Pri is very popular, and her name also has a respectable basis. It was Chief Director Tomino who named her. When he was looking at a book, the director saw a description of a clan of adorable fairies, and he used their name just as it was. In other words, the L people. See, she isn't Lolicon bait. Uh-huh. Wah, what? It's a source pulled from the reference material. That proves it. Does it now? You know, I was hoping someone would bring this up. Because you see, my foolish friend, you've already been defeated. You just don't know yet. What? What are you talking about? You see, it's funny. Though I didn't watch them for this, it did pay off. Kind of ironically. What? What is it? If Puru really was derived from this idea of a cute fairy, oh, oh gosh, if only we had two previous Tomino shows, two works where a cute fairy featured prominently. Wait, hold on. You know, a work with a cute moi moi kun fairy as mainly a mascot? No, stop. And then a sequel series where, despite the setting being science fiction and having nothing to do with it, because of the character's popularity, because of the, you know, those fans, she was awkwardly inserted into that one as well. No! And in said series, she was both a cutesy mascot and was the source of fan service. Really, it sounds like the Animec people were, and this is being polite, trying to dust their tracks and failed miserably. Puru doesn't act like a fairy. She acts like a fetishistic Imuto Lolita meant to attract the same people who caused Cham Fao to return as Lilith in L game. Though now, in Devil Zeta, with a character with no thin fairy veneer, all little sister. No, no, because, no, it's not Lemon People. You are twisting the words and ignoring the example. It's all there. Actually, you're right. It is all there. Let's read the other section translated by the wonderful Mr. Simmons. Ahem. <clears throat> the relationship between Elpo Play and Play 2 wasn't made clear on the screen, but it's a point of concern for fans. Thus, we'll look at Elpo Play and Play 2, throwing in Glemmy as an extra bonus, and tell you the secrets of their birth. Even though these relationships weren't clearly explained on screen, they were firmly established in the setting. First, let's start with Glemmy. 
He was actually a test tube baby, created by artificially inseminating the eggs of a woman who had new type attributes with the sperm of Giranzabi, who appeared in the old series. The plays were artificially created in the same way from Giranzabi and a new type woman, making them Glemmy's younger sisters. However, they used the eggs of a different woman from the one used for Glemmy, and they appear to be artificial twins with an exactly the same chromosome, genes. Wait, no. Yes, that's right. According to your source, Glemmy doesn't just have a bunch of little girls frozen in his basement. No, Glemmy actually has a bunch of frozen naked clone sisters in his basement. Meaning, Glemmy is maybe the biggest incestuous lollicon groomer of them all. Even if you interpret Char at his worst, and he wasn't anywhere close to this, and that's mostly baseless speculation from retarded fans. This, on the other hand, as you said, is hard evidence. No, 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 no. What is it? Is it a viable source or not, my friend? You really must read through citations thoroughly, you know. NOOO, they were naked because of cryogenic stasis. It would explain the weird, well, grooming of Lena. No. That's the right word, I think. I swear it's not pedophilia. Well, that was fun. So, yes, Puru sucks. Puru was made to appeal to those fans. And I neither enjoy her characterization and existence, nor the existence of those fans very much at all. My favorite Puru moment was, uh, I think it was when, just after Lena died, Puru selfishly pleads to Judao that she can be his new Imoto. Judao pushes her down, and then she just starts crying uncontrollably. I think I laughed for about five minutes straight. Of course, the real criminal in all this is still unnamed. The reason for a lighter Gundam. The reason for Double Zeta's egregious by then Gundam standard of fan service, panty shots and all. The reason for the desperate shift in tone literally massacring the characterization of the primary actors in this story. So, let us move on then. One day we will return to savoring this battlefield. One day. Until then, let's talk about big cool robots. With episode 37, the Argama is abandoned on Earth. Bright and the Gunnam team make for space and board the Nehel Argama. It's funny in retrospect how much Unicorn made the ship feel like some important vehicle for the history of UC, when in reality it was mostly hijacked by a bunch of teenagers and used incoherently to sort of end a war which didn't matter in the long run anyways. Now, am I saying Unicorn is Universal Century Revisionism? Yes. But that's for another day. Bright leaves the ship, it's now up to the Degrassi kids to save space and the Earth. Here we get another prime example of Double Zeta spinning in circles. The episode 37 ending is climactic with the Nehel Argama departing to fight Neo Zeon. Only for it to come right back to Levion Rose the very next episode. Oh, so they could reunite with Bright, right? No, no, really, Bright feels like a principal, and the plot of the Degrassi kids just sort of happens to him over and over again, and he just leaves. The most he gets in this series is a very awkward marriage infidelity subplot with Emery, the Anaheim technician in charge of Levion Rose. It's not bad for what it is, it's, I guess it's very possible, given Bright's work life, but it's a, I mean, it's downgraded by Emery largely being the, you know, firmly in the bad female character camp, in so far as her actions and decisions go. She makes a lot of irrational decisions out of her romantic pursuit. Ah, how I love it. Ultimately, later, she just dies. Spinning the wheels feels like a very apt description just about everything in this show. Does this ruin Bright Noah? No, because none of this actually matters to Char's counterattack or in the long run anyways. The plot sees the return of the Moonies, I mean, sorry, Moon Moon Sisters. And then, for like four episodes, we get stuck doing yet more wacky hijinks in a vaguely Hong Kong-themed space colony. We get hilarious anime cross-dressing, which is, um, it's fan service for someone. Don't worry, Argon, the back half of the show is good, people once told me. Even here, at 11 before midnight, on the climax of the plot, it still seems more than happy to just waste time with teen drama. Oh no, one of the Moonanite, I'm sorry, Moon Moon Sisters dies. Oh no, they, I mean, they barely got developed anyway, so I have a hard time feeling anywhere near the tragedy the show seems to want to spotlight on them. What is more important, a lot more important, is we get a different kind of fan service. The sex pest mayor of the 
Hong Kong Colony has a rock garden. In it are a number of weird and niche mobile suit designs making their return. Even some designs planned for 0079 but never used. But why do you mention that Argon? Why leave the mobile suit section so late until now? Oh, patience, dear viewer. You will soon see. Trust me. Even before this episode, the Regal Goog shows up, piloted by now evil Mashmire's handler, another bad female character who just dies, so I won't waste time on her. Around the same time, the Storm Dias shows up as well, a kind of upgraded version of the Rick Dias from Zeta. Both of these mark out a trend in line with some suits which showed up earlier, namely the very Dom-like Dryson as well as the various MSV Zaku Desert variants. This is important, in fact. Very important. This is key evidence. For now, let's dig into the mechanical design of Double Zeta. This is where a lot of the facts of the case start to come together in big ways. Now, rather interestingly, a huge amount of the focus coming out of Zeta and into Double Zeta was given to just the question of who and what the main Gundam's designer and its design would be. Like, a ton of interviews go into only this, pretty much. Here is where our big final clues come together, my friends. Let's, let's start off by noting that originally, Mamoru Nagano was supposed to design the Double Zeta. A monthly Bandai making journal from, I think, 1986 featuring Nagano's Double Zeta in a promo section. I guess this old comment of, there's no way my Gundam would transform, wasn't really true in the long run, huh? In a lot of ways, this Double Zeta is a follow-up to Heavy Metal L Game's L Game Mark II, both in its transformation and its overall design. His draft designs were talked about a lot excitedly. Only, as those of you might probably already know, Nagano and his curse didn't end up getting his design chosen. In fact, Nagano ended up not really having much of an impact in Double Zeta's mechanical design at all, even less than Zeta's. The initial Storm Dias was a Nagano design, with final design coming from another returning name, Mika Akitaka. This would actually be the second of three times, almost in a row, where Nagano was pulled, likely by Tamino, to work on a Gundam project, but then pressured off of it. This is his curse. After all, it makes sense, Nagano read Tomino's Animation Seki Sengen Declaration, as those of you remember from the 0079 video. Tomino and Nagano worked together on Heavy Metal L Game. So I get the impression Nagano was kind of a friend of Tomino, or at least someone who he endorsed a lot. So why the repeated problems after L Game of Nagano just leaving? Well, as you'll soon see, there's a running trend. It was likely down to the model kits. A combination of, for the time, high complexity and low sales, though exactly how low is hard to say, is what we seem to get as Bandai's constant motivation in pressuring Sunrise to move him off of projects. For Shar's counterattack, Tomino had to personally come by and essentially fire Nagano off the project. Someone who recalled this directly is another important voice in mechanical design I can bring up now after hinting at him last time, Yutaka Izabuchi. Izabuchi had previously worked with Tomino initially on Zabungle, and then as primary designer on Dunbuy. From the model graphics Special Gundam Wars 2 Mission Double Zeta, a roundtable with Makoto Kobayashi, Mika Akitaka, and Mr. Izabuchi, where Izabuchi says how he got started on Zeta and Nagano leaving. Kobayashi. Mr. Izabuchi, who was it who approached you? Izabuchi. In my case, it was Mr. Yamura on the Nippon Sunrise planning office side. I think there was about 20 people in total, right? That's Akitaka. Izabuchi. There were designs by Mr. Nagano, and the rumor was that they were having trouble getting them past the sponsor. Then, right around the end of the year, I suddenly got a phone call saying, We're very sorry, but could you draw something for us? I asked, How should I draw? And they said, uh, About nine. Huh? Nine? By when? And they said they'd like them within the year. It's likely the same pressures are what ultimately kicked Nagano's design out from becoming Double Zetas even possibly what may have kicked his Zeta out, causing Fujita's design to win. Getting back to Izabuchi, his designs, like the Gallus J, our Jarja, and so on, would fill out a lot of Double Zeta's enemy design roster. He would also have a transforming design in the Bawu as well. But Izabuchi's star was still rising at the time of Double Zeta, and we will return to his contributions to Gundam in the final episode in the series next time. Before moving on completely, Mika Akitaki's contributions were designs like the Guy Malk, Dovin Wolf and Jamru Finn. Hmm, awfully big boys, no? Kind of getting fat. In general, though, Double Zeta would still see a wide range, but slightly less wide range of designs compared to Zeta. Now, this I can say I don't, on paper, dislike. Having a more focused design language leads itself to a more coherent work. Tomino basically echoed this as well. 
from B Club Volume 3, December 1985. B Club. On Zeta Gundam, you took the approach of having mecha designs by multiple designers. Was that successful? Tell me no. Of course, if you look at the variety of mobile suits in Zeta Gundam, it's clear that it produced some results. But on the other hand, the problem was that the individual designers didn't stand out. Originally, we had multiple designers so that individual designs couldn't be produced, but it turned out like this because making them compete turned the whole thing into a classroom. In a classroom, you can't stand out from the crowd and become number one unless you're really excellent as a student. So even if they stimulated each other, they all end up doing so and kind of just copying other people. This leads to a good example of someone who stood out from the rest to the last name from that earlier interview, my man, Makoto Kobayashi. Kobayashi's design would end up being the one main selected one for the double Zeta in the end, with cleanup done by others. Kenji Uchida, the producer on Zeta, who did likewise on Double Zeta, mentions a kind of a great summation from the Double Zeta memorial box from 1996. Ultimately, seeking an image that would contrast with the speedy feeling of the Zeta designs, we decided to go with a massive design created by Mr. Makoto Kobayashi. We're also truly indebted to Mr. Mika Akitaka for his help with the mecha designs in general. Uchida also mentions the trouble with selecting the main machine. There was what seems like a lot of pressure on the protagonist mecha and which design it should be based on, for reasons you'll soon see later. From that same interview, when we transitioned to Double Zeta, we decided to use a different combination than Mr. Yasuhiko, Mr. Okawara, and Mr. Kazumi Fujita. It was decided relatively early on that we'd go with Mr. Hiroyuki Kirozume for the characters, but we had a hard time deciding on the mecha. Thus, we asked a concept creation team, Visual Design, to come up with some mobile suit ideas. I showed these to Mr. Tamino and then requested designs from various people based on the concepts that came out of that. That's the way that we did it. If we return to the B Club roundtable, we get to hear the selection process from Mr. Kobayashi's perspective. Kobayashi, it was December 27th of last year, the day before the model graphics year-end party. They said we were going with a transformation plan by a toy company called TT Brain, but it wouldn't work with its current form. So they asked me to complete the transformation and make it stick together perfectly. So they'd nail down how it would be used in the story and then based on that they pass it around so that it could be fleshed out. Kobayashi, that's right. They told me it was a competition with January 6th as a deadline. He's a Buchi. I passed in the Double Zeta Gundam. I said something like, transformation is too much trouble, and ran away immediately. Kobayashi. I guess that's how they figured I was a transforming mecha otaku, but it turned out producer Ochida hadn't told me everything. What about the core fighter? At first he said they didn't need one and that it'd be okay with just an A and B parts. But in fact, there was a core fighter, and later I was told that even though there was a core fighter, people could also ride in the A and B parts and use them to escape. I said, any more than this, and it's impossible. Izabuchi, good for you. If they'd asked me for something like that, I'd have said, eh, can't do it. Kobayashi. Then, after I submitted it on the 9th, I had a phone call from the department chief, Matsumoto at Bandai. If possible, they wanted me to make a three-dimensional model as well, and they said I could revise the transformation at that point. I think I finished that around the 15th, and after that, it went to Shindosha, right? So now you talk to Mr. Mutaka. It's a good flow. Izabuchi, it feels like a proper conversation. Akitaka, at first it wasn't decided whether Mr. Hideo Okamoto or I would be the main one doing it. That's why, for the time being, the TV caption just said Shindosha. Kobayashi, I was shown Mr. Mika Akitaka's cleanup around five days after it was finished. Akitaka, oh really? Kobayashi, they said thanks to you, it's going to be like this. One thing I always felt beforehand about Double Zeta's shift away from Zeta's approach was what felt like, for me, more of a super robot approach to design. The mobile suits of 0079, beyond the Gundam's core fighter docking, had a focus on a very, by the time, restrained amount of attacks. Compared to the Daitarns, Voltez, and Getter, and Mazingers, they embrace a lot of that powered armor infantry feel. One melee weapon, for the most part. Barring, of course, once again, the RX-78's array. A rifle, or a bazooka, and then maybe head Vulcans three to four-ish attacks on average. Really, pretty restrained as far as I said in the first video. Zaku came with the weapons theory. There is still a lot of that in Double Zeta, but when you start to get more and more wacky stuff, it's just straight super robo at times, eschewing the weapons theory entirely. The standard examples being stuff like the Gaimalk, this giant red beam spewing design which seems to have an excessive emphasis on weapons. Beam knees, beam fingers, beam shoulders, and funnels! More and more and more and more! It was supposed to be pretty big as well, 20 plus meters initially. 
The Tiger Bomb Colony as well highlights this. This parade of wacky old mobile suits all next to one another feels very much like a, I don't know, an array of Mazinger robots of the week. Which to an extent, within 0079, they kind of always were. It's just stacking them up here really only highlights that. But this isn't odd because Tomino kind of spelled this out himself from the B Club December 85 interview. Tomino. Because it's a giant robot show, the premise of this production is that the work also needs to incorporate the humor of things like Mazinger Z. So now, among the staff, we're all talking about a light Gundam, an enjoyable Gundam, a Gundam for everyone. In short, that's the way I'd like to do it. The mobile suits will still be treated seriously, so we're not going to have someone call Double Zeta and the Gundam comes flying out. I just want to have a structure that says it's a giant robot show. Really early on, you can feel this quite strongly in enemies like the Junkyard Robot. When I saw it, all I could think was Boss Borat. But I think this extends to the Double Zeta itself, maybe more than the RX-78, and definitely more than the Zeta. The Double Zeta feels like a super robo. But Gundam is real robo! The troper cries out, his compartmentalized brain buckling, oozing out his nose. Another reason to put real and super as TV tropes pages into the fucking garbage. Regardless of whether I thought Double Zeta was good or not, by merely the third chapter in Gundam, mobile suits were already borrowing more from older works, despite being the supposed franchise that also started real robot as a genre. The moral is, once again, fuck TV tropes. All my homies hate TV tropes. From this absurdly massive collection of beam sabers to the fact it combines it with three parts, not just legs upper and lower, but really an idion or really a getter kind of combo of pieces, it has a huge array of weapons built in, and maybe the biggest thing which makes me feel this way is the high mega cannon in its head. All it really needed was just to flex its arms when it fired, and we'd pretty much be golden. From the Memorial Box interview with Makoto Kobayashi, Seeking the ultimate Gundam by giving the RX-78 a wave motion gun. Naturally, when I actually saw it on screen, it was also different from what I'd originally imagined. I thought, that might be the head, might be the high mega cannon, it might be more impressive as powerful as a solar ray, but after firing one shot, all the Double Zeta's functions would temporarily shut down, and the Gundam team would have to protect it in the meantime. Since it was originally based on the wave motion gun from Space Battleship Yamato, and the mecha from Zeta Gundam would still be involved in the story development, I thought it would be fine for it to be an ultimate weapon. So, you put it all together, a machine which combines from three jets, a giant head laser beam, a ton of weapons, and so on, if you were describing this in abstract, it honestly sounds more like a Getter or a Mazinger than a Gundam at times. All in all, I enjoy a lot of Double Zeta's mechanical design. Now, with all that being said, it's time to stop smiling. It's time to get to the big reveal. The real reason behind the source of Double Zeta's problems. What? What, you thought this section's placement was just coincidental? <laughs> oh, no way, my friend. You see, everything I just talked about is all the parts of the answer. In fact, the true criminal the true perpetrator. It was all right here. In fact, it may be in the very room you are watching this in, lining your shelves, looking at you from behind a plate of glass, or waiting inside boxes piled around you. Because, you see, I already mentioned what it was. This very section, in fact, this is what I started the very first video on the series with. The same thing which rotted out Double Zeta was the thing which almost killed 0079 in its cradle. The true criminal was in front of us all along, the model kits, or really, the gunpla. The same thing which cut 0079 short and got Nagano kicked off of the project after project from the Great Mechanics Volume 6, Project Gundam, is laid out by as well, Katsumi Kawaguchi. Looking at it from the production side, it may have been inevitable that Mobile Suit Gundam Double Zeta was launched as a successor to Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam. Even before the production of Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam began, Director Tomino was saying, if we restart Gundam, it will be a long series that runs for about two years. It was around October 1985 that Sunrise and Bandai began discussing the idea of producing Mobile Suit Gundam Double Zeta as a sequel to Zeta Gundam. Considering that work on the next program normally starts in about six months before the broadcast begins, this timing wasn't at all premature. At the time, the broadcast of Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam had passed the halfway point and was about to enter its third core. However, there was a problem. After the start of the program, the briefly strong sales of related merchandise had begun trending downward. Mr. Katsumi Kawaguchi then, in his second year working on product development with Bandai Hobby Products Department, recalls that time. 
Nowadays, Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam is highly regarded as a work, and the merchandise is also popular. But during the broadcast, we started seeing a merchandising decline around autumn. Nonetheless, it had been decided that Zeta Gundam would run for four core, and that to Bandai, the Gundam brand was too valuable to abandon. So we told the Sunrise side, we want you to do another sequel and continue the Gundam title. At that point, we began discussing what we should do after Zeta Gundam was over. From then on, there was also talk within the company that the story of Zeta Gundam was too difficult and the story was too dark. Based on those opinions, we talked with Sunrise about how we should proceed in the next year after Zeta Gundam. Thanks to the success of the movies, Gundam had already transformed into a character that even children recognized. In that respect, our expectations may have been too optimistic. As a result of Zeta Gundam, we began to see a decline in a brand that had previously boasted steadfast popularity. And there was confusion within the company, as people said, it wasn't supposed to be like this. Thus, there was talk that, to some extent, the upcoming new Gundam also had to consider children as part of the target demographic. So we said to Gundam's producer, Mr. Kenji Uchida, how about a light Gundam that will be easier for kids to understand? Mr. Kawaguchi, wait! The Double Zeta Gundam aimed at kids also had the most sex freak fan service, including of a child? Isn't that counterintuitive? No, because they were trying to capture the biggest audience possible, you see. They were trawling with a wide net. But now for the smoking gun. With Bandai spearheading the process, the keywords of Light Gundam as the style and a Gundam that combines and transforms were presented. And this was proposed to the Sunrise side as a concept for the next series. Mr. Koichi Inoue who was then involved in the development of each project at the Sunrise Planning Office recalls the situation at the time. The order from our sponsors, Bandai, is that since Zeta Gundam was dark, we want the next Gundam to have a lighter style. Director Tomino would be creating the story and drama, so we left the content of the work up to him. As for what the Sunrise Planning Office was doing in the meantime, it became our job to decide the direction of things, like the setting for the so-called mobile suits. Though the director Tomino gave the order regarding the image of the mobile suits as characters, like, it should feel powerful. He didn't give us any detailed instructions about the overall mobile suit systems. Are you seeing it? Is it coming together? Well hold on, because now I got the updated coroner's report. I told you this was important. The Double Zeta Gundam's design was burdened with a variety of demands and aspirations. To broaden the audience, to rebuild the merchandising, which would begin to decline, to return to the starting point, to create a new image for Gundam. Looking back on the design now, we might wonder whether the idea of a Gundam that could withstand these excessive pressures was embodied in the Double Zeta's oversized equipment and powerful form. But, in the end, it couldn't create a merchandising revival, and a variety of measures were taken to prop up the program as it entered its second half. A representative example was the question of how to merchandise Mobile Suit Gundam Double Zeta products, sell them in large quantities without raising costs. In the second half of the program, the molds of mass-produced mobile suits that had appeared in the past were recycled to create new variations. Among these releases were the Regelgu, an improved Gelgug, and the Gaz-L and Gaz-R, which reused the Galbaldi Beta's molds. So there you have it, folks. The idea of a two-year series, that was certainly Tomino's initial design. Maybe a bit of a lighter series that fits a Tomino cycle as well. But everything which followed was a manifestation of the weaknesses and messiness of the series. It's all the Gunpla's fault. The desperation for an immediate continuation despite it rushing the planning? Gunpla. It was always Gunpla. The initially lighter, more super robo tone to appeal to kids? Gunpla. The subsequent course correction to appeal to older designs and audiences? Diminishing sales of Gunpla. Why did I have to sit through almost 50 fucking episodes of Chara Boob and Puru Bubble Baths? Why did Mashmire turn into a genocidal freak and Glemmy get an army of clones? Why did Bright Noah tolerate a borderline incompetent crew of Degrassi pilots and Judao had the thinking complexity of a grapefruit? It was also Japanese kids in the 10 to 17 year demographic range in addition to adults in the 18 to 30 year range would hopefully not be too alienated to buy more fucking plastic. That is it. Whoa. Well, having said that, that sounds like that's it, right? I mean, case solved, right? Oh, sure, absolutely. Only got a couple of few more little questions here. Namely, the big one. Did they manage to do it? Did they get away with murder? And also, what the f- Sayla? And Lena's still alive? 
The giant three-part transforming body may be cold, but we gotta wrap it up in a suitably big metaphorical black bag, no? The last three episodes of Double Zeta are, in a lot of ways, a lot like a condensed form of Double Zeta as a whole. Where 0079 built up to the final climax of Aobaoku, and Zeta had its dark spiral of Operation Maelstrom towards the battle over Grips, there is a deciding lack of tension here. Judao helps Chara because he likes her tits, I guess. The final battle is drawn out over three episodes, more Ayug or Federation forces absent from the rest of the series finally show up and do very little. Glemmy is unsurprisingly killed by Ro, the worst character dying to the best. One by one, Haman's goons die off, the best probably being Mashmire simply exploding from too much honor juice. Char soon screams out her name like a Pokemon, Rakan Dakaran- oh, oh, I never mentioned him. Oh, he was okay. He honestly didn't end up doing that much. There's this thing about liberating a mining asteroid, Haman attached to her base at side 3. Oh, no way, Purutu dies, what? Oh, but, oh, no way. Really, the main thing I was thinking of was what Tomino kind of said from earlier. Tomino. As I imagine him, I feel Judao is a person who can get out his gloomy feelings without storing them in his mind. But that's hard to show on screen. It's up to the ability of the episode directors, and I'm not sure how well it'll ultimately look on film. As I said earlier, at this point, it's not yet decided whether we'll be making 50 episodes, so I don't know whether we'll be able to depict that. And then there wouldn't be enough time to show Judao's nature as a new type, either. I was thinking about it because we finally, at last, get Judao's big, personal statement about his motivations, and it's fine. It's, it's okay. The world is in a rough spot. Self-interest will only do more harm than good. It's alright. I, I even agree. Did it need 46 episodes? I don't really think so. It kind of got it pretty early on. There honestly just doesn't feel like a ton of growth here. Like, Judao in Episode 2 could probably say something pretty similar. Once again, Judao is very agreeable, but not really interesting. Nothing here is really novel. Like, despite the intro's animation, what Judao says here is also pretty much half of Camille's deal. I fight with everyone's wills within me. Yeah, I know Judao. So did Camille. So did Amuro as well, really. People bound by blood are just in the way. Yeah, like those whose souls are held down by gravity were in Zeta. I agreed with the philosophy then, and I still do. It's a good core philosophy for a Gundam protagonist. But the closer here is, okay, but do we need another 50 episodes to have someone else restate that? Once again, Judao has such a flat trajectory within his arc within Double Zeta, it all feels redundant or incomplete. And hey, if you want proof, look no further than Big T Man himself. In a rather uh, optimistic November 1986 interview with New Type Magazine, Tommy No. Double Zeta has gathered enough strength to continue for another year, so the last episode in January of next year won't be an ordinary finale. The Shangri La characters will survive in good spirits, and in the last episode, I plan to end with the protagonist Judao Ashta setting off on a journey. Judao isn't like the previous Amuro or Camille, I think he's a character with the potential to become a fine protagonist in a positive sense. He can be a protagonist who doesn't think about anything. Meanwhile, Judao isn't yet spiritually mature enough to understand his fellow new types, but after he leaves on his journey and then returns, maturing both spiritually and as a human being, I think he'll become a fine protagonist. That's the reason for sending Judao on a journey in the last episode. And then, after a one-year hiatus, a new Gundam will begin when he returns. Thus, it won't be a continuation of Double Zeta, but a completely new story in which I want Judao to once again play the leading role. As a creator, I'd really like to do that. Um, well, sorry, Tommy No, as we now know with the 1 million times 1 million hindsight, no, Judao never came back. Whereas Camille at least ended his story on a climactic sacrifice, Judao feels unfinished, or rather, as Tommy No basically says, barely even started. Which kind of gets back to the bigger point. Gundam, a series which really defined itself by its new type characters, had its third chapter ultimately be steered by, well, not much of a new type. Sorry, Tommy No. You had 46 episodes. If that isn't enough to develop him at least to some extent, would 100 suddenly work? I mean, it's not Log here, come on. In final summary, I don't hate Judao. I laughed at a good number of his antics, but I never loved or was captivated by Judao. He's like a, he's like a Big Mac, you know, he's easy to swallow, consistent, but he's not a good burger. 
I think maybe having Peru constantly sit on his lap and, and do the new type shit for him may have actually been the kicker. Her being there and doing that, sensing for Jadao, just sort of drains any new type development on his part and dumps it all into another body headed for the dumpster. As if I needed another reason not to like Puru. I have to laugh at Tomino's August new type interview again, but as far as I'm concerned, even if El Play character shows up and acts out the drama of a meeting between fellow new types with Judao, it certainly won't follow the same pattern as the two previous works. I want to show it with Double Zeta's unique storytelling. And then he just, um, he ends up with Rao. No, they don't build up to this. It just happens. Whatever. Sayla shows up at the end with Judao's sister. How did Sayla know to save a random girl she'd never met in Dakar? A city under attack, possibly tens of kilometers away. What, you thought it was new type awareness? <laughs> no, no, it was just fan service. From Animedia, 1987, November. All Gundam Guide. Sayla wasn't intended to appear in Double Zeta. This is because they were trying to save her for the movie, and because Sayla's voice actor, Mrs. Yo Inoue, was out of the country. But when it was decided to save Lena, who was supposed to have been killed, someone was needed to rescue her. After considering who this should be, the staff chose Sayla for the sake of fan service. That's how Sayla came to appear without saying a single word. That's it. It was just more fan service. And to say Shar Aznable will not be appearing in Double Zeta, he is someplace else planning for next time. Amazing. In a lot of ways, It Just Happens sums up the plot of this whole show very well. Judao and the Gundam team barely managed to do pretty much of anything at all. Not Lino or L or Bicho or Mondo really, really actively managed to save the day. The rise of Neo Zeon and its implosion from the Glemi Haman Civil War are events which are ultimately entirely internal. Just like Haman's hyper competent take over the Earth and the on screen hyper incompetence in the face of Jadao, it's all stuff that just sort of happens to the cast, making them feel like bystanders. Jadao failing to develop into a full new type like Amaro or Camille likewise changes very little. But it. did it work, Argon? Did it, did it pay off? Did it bring back the Gunpla sales? In the end, with the conclusion of the series? <laughs> no. Duh. What do you think? From the same Great Mechanics magazine from October 2002, Bandai also issued many orders compared to Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam, such as the situation featuring lots of mass-produced mobile suits. But, Mobile Suit Gundam Double Zeta was ultimately unable to stop the downward trend in both audience ratings and merchandising, and thus the program came to an end. From this viewpoint, Mobile Suit Gundam Double Zeta may indeed have been a failure, Looking back, Mr. Kawaguchi of Bandai says, Because the planning started while Zeta was in the middle of its broadcasting run, the lack of preparation time meant that we couldn't really dig into expanding the target audience. So, as part of the Gundam series, was Mobile Suit Gundam Double Zeta just a fruitless exercise? Great Mechanics tries to say no, because Double Zeta did stuff later Gundams followed. There is some interesting parallels there, and there is some truth, but... I say, yeah, insofar as Universal Century goes, it failed to work as either a new start or part three. So there you have it in full. There you have it. The mystery of Double Zeta. Solved before your eyes by my humble efforts. Tomino had wanted a two-year Gundam project, but the emphasis on the tone was mandated mostly by the toy company. Unlike with Zeta, which had time and planning to, to create a freedom for Tomino's team, Double Zeta heavily mandated by the studio as a merchandising effort was mostly done in a scramble. Then when the light Gundam didn't pan out, they pivoted to dark serious Gundam. And when that course correction ultimately didn't pan out, Sunrise wrapped up the series with just never returned to do a triple Zeta. Tamino and Sunrise and Bandai returned to the OG status quo with Shah's counterattack and focused on concluding Shah and Amaro's story as that was the real core of UC all along. Well, no way. Honestly. And I mean this with all sincerity. My issues here are not just Double Zeta was not Zeta. I do positively think that if the show had been really committed, like really committed, to the giant cross in space, pig bone in a grave type, jokey tone, gone further with it, I think I would love this show. I would laugh at it. I don't see how that was possible given the pressure Tomino was under and the writers and Sunrise and all under Bandai, but I think I would have liked that show. Double Zeta, however, was not that show. Unlike 0079 and Zeta, which were creatively driven, 
Double Zeta was a profit motive driven, and it shows in the low quality and the failure of the work. No way, making art for creative reasons, not money, that works better. Crazy. Hey, at least Camille recovered finally and is with a fa, and that made me tear up a little bit. My little blue haired punk is running with his GF, running on that frigid Scottish beaches in a happy Scottish ending. Oh, bless him. In the end, the real question of Double Zeta, did 0079's sequel need a sequel, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because the real true moral of Double Zeta is this. Bandai needed Double Zeta. Bandai needed Double Zeta to sell a lot more bright colored plastic. Uh, but it didn't. <laughs>